This has all the hallmarks of being kind of a downer, doesn't it? Um, yeah, you, you read a passage like that, and I recognize that um, just about everyone is leaning forward in their seats and thinking to themselves, I wonder what he's going to do next. And I am so thankful that I am not the one preaching. Um, so open invitation, anyone who wants to come up and take my place, you're welcome to, um, or we can just close in prayer now. Um, I, I do want to pause for a second and acknowledge, as you heard in the reading, uh, there are subject matters that are probably going to be PG, and I'm going to try to keep them as PG as possible, but I can't control, um, what questions your children will ask. Uh, so I'm just giving you the heads up. We've got a few minutes before we're going to get into the uh, PG part. So if you if you want an option um, to do something different, you you can do that. Uh, but I would. Uh, but again, I, I'm going to endeavor to do my best to try to keep this as PG as possible. That is also why, by the way, that I have my manuscript up here, um, and I am going to be reading a lot. If you're a guest, uh, I try not to do that. I never bring my manuscript up here, but this is a morning where um, we are going to, I am going to try to choose my words extremely carefully and prayerfully. Um, and I can assure you that 10 minutes after the sermon is over, there will be a plenty of things that I'm going to wish that I had said differently, um, but I will do, do my best. A very wise and godly person who's actually here this morning um, once counseled me to avoid passages like this. Um, and it's not because he didn't think they were important. Uh, he thought they're extremely important and need to be talked about. It's actually because they were so important that he said, here's the problem. You can't say everything that needs to be said in 35 minutes about this topic. You just can't. And he's right. Uh, so we're going to go longer than 35 minutes this morning. Um, <laughs> uh, I could be up here for an hour and a half. And, and I promise I won't. Don't worry. Um, and I can't say what needs to be said about this passage. Um, it is... Ten minutes before church started, I was sitting at a desk still reworking what do I say and what do I not say. So I will appreciate grace uh, as we work through this. There's another problem um, when it comes to preaching a passage like this, and that is that the church and our culture are not on the same page when it comes not just to the big issue that's named in this passage, there are 22, depending on how you count it, it could be 23 or 21, but say 22 different behaviors, actions, or attitudes, character traits, you call them vices, that are named in this passage. And you can go through virtually every single one of them, and you can identify significant segments of our culture who would say, not only do we think they're fine, we don't even think they're a moral issue at all that's worthy of discussion. Just this week, I read an article that I got, it was, you know, like random email that I got, that was about why gossip is good. Um, it, in that article, never once referenced what happens to the person who's gossiped about, but that's okay. Let me tell you the hardest part about this sermon. The hard part about this sermon is that we come with deep emotions that surround the issues in these verses. There is powerful, powerful self-protection and self-righteousness that will come out when we read this passage and when we study it closely. No one 
No one in this room, including me, wants to believe that their sin is as bad as what Paul actually says in these verses. No one wants to think that their gossip belongs on the same list as a hater of God. But there it is. There's a question that haunts every single one of us every single day. And it's some form of the question, is it possible to genuinely and deeply love someone who struggles with sin? Can we delight to see someone and be with someone and be near someone who struggles with sin? And the question that we are really asking is, can you love me, delight in me? And be near me as someone who struggles with sin. And we fear that the answer is no. And so we fear that to take this passage seriously means being rejected and rejecting others. Here's a spoiler alert. Paul is saying the exact opposite in this passage. But we will unfold that. We also must acknowledge that this passage raises the issue of homosexuality. And there are people sitting here today, I know them, for whom being attracted to the same sex is their normal. If they have never known life any other way, it is what they have always experienced. And when we read a passage like that, I can promise you the question that is going through their mind right now is, is this church a place where they can meet the love of God? The answer to that question is yes. There are people here, and I know them, who have family who are in different forms of same-sex relationships or they are wrestling with same-sex attraction. And here is something that I've seen time and time again. When someone you love comes out of the closet, family members, especially if they are in church, go in the closet. Because they are afraid that they will be shamed and that they will be rejected by the people in the church. And we've got people who are in that category here this morning who are wondering that very same thing. I would much rather sit down with individuals and have extended two-hour conversations where we could ask questions, listen, clarify, cry together, and genuinely love one another. But my task this morning is to preach the passage that is in front of me. And that means trying to understand what the Holy Spirit is doing here and to try to apply it in a way that is honest, that is loving, and that is helpful no matter who you are. And as you can tell from reading through this passage, these are sobering verses. And the tone of the sermon this morning is probably going to match that to a very large extent. Um, guys, we're about to engage in some very, very hard soul work. And again, that's why I'm actually reading much of this sermon today. Well, let's uh, kind of get into this passage. It's really important, especially in this passage. It's incredibly important that we pay attention to the context of the passage. So let's go back to last week's sermon and remember what we said about the first half of Romans 1. We talked about the fact that Romans, what the Roman church, and there could have been as many as 12 of them in Rome, the Roman church was almost certainly founded by Jews who had come to Christ in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. They went back to Rome and they started the Roman church. Now, as frequently happened, we see this throughout the book of Acts, Gentiles would come to Christ and then become a part of that church. 
And that's the way it ran for about 16 years. The Jews were the ones who were in charge of that church. They ran the church. They shaped what the culture of the church was like, how worship was expressed, how people lived. They were the ones who were in charge of that church. And then in 49 AD, Emperor Claudius uh, it gets very upset with the Jews, and he wants all Jews out of Rome, every one of them. That means all the Jews that are in charge of these churches are out. Paul writes this book about eight years later. And when he writes this book, we know that Jews were already coming back into Rome. They were being allowed back in. And what you've got in the Roman church is a group of Jews who used to be in charge, who have come back in and discovered that the Gentiles have been in charge and things are going just fine, but the church looks different. And a great deal of what Romans addresses is about how do you make sense of these two groups coming together. And a huge part of what Paul argues is that the reason that there is strife is because you have a misunderstanding of the nature of righteousness. And that becomes the core theme throughout the book. And we saw this chart last week. That what Paul is going to do after, we, after he introduces the core theme is he is going to focus the first 12 chapters on the fact that God gives righteousness. And then the last part of the book is how the righteous are to live by faith. This week we are entering into this first section where Paul is going to lay out what is the need for righteousness. And here's how he makes that argument. In today's passage, he's going to argue that God's wrath is just. It is, it is right. It is appropriate. It is fair for every person, even those without the law. Remember, because a huge part of this church were Gentiles. And they didn't grow up with the law. And so if Paul's going to say God's wrath is coming, Gentiles would say, hey, we don't have the advantage of having the law. Paul's going to say, God's wrath is just even for you. And we're going to see as we go through this passage, he immediately is, is implicating everyone, whether they have the law or not. Next week, he is going to show that God's wrath is just in its final execution. And by the way, again, spoiler alert, if you read ahead, the very first verse of Romans 2, the very next verse that will follow this is going to raise the question, who are you to judge? Because his point is, every single one of you is guilty. Every one of you. And you have no basis for judgment. But God is just. Then he's going to argue that God's wrath is just for everyone, even those with the law. And then in some verses we are very familiar with, no one is righteous on their own efforts. And then Paul is going to use this as a basis for moving into the grace of God. So what we're going to see this morning as we unpack this passage is that Paul is going to announce the revelation of God's wrath. He's going to give us the reason for it, and he's going to give us the result of it. And verse 18 is this declaration of, of God's wrath, the revelation of God's wrath. And Paul's point is that God's wrath is his righteous response to our unrighteousness. Now, because the introduction breaks at verse 17, it's really easy to lose kind of the flow of thought that Paul is, is developing here. Notice, for example, that when Paul says in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed, he's actually parallel with something that he said in verse 17. The righteousness of God is revealed. So what is his argument? How is it developing? It goes back to verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why am I not ashamed of the gospel? Because it's the power of God for salvation. Well, how is it the power of God for salvation? Because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Why? What's going on there? Because in it, God's wrath is also revealed. Two points that are going to be developed through the book of Romans. Is that you can't understand the gospel unless you start with your sinfulness. 
if you don't own your mess, you don't understand the gospel. Second thing is, God's righteousness is revealed because of the good news of Jesus. The righteousness that Jesus lived gets applied to us because of the cross. That is how wrath reveals God's righteousness. To understand this verse, you have to remember what the Bible means when it talks about God's wrath. We did a sermon series a couple summers ago about the nature of God, and we did a whole sermon on the wrath of God. God's wrath is not God being out of control, angry for no good reason. God's wrath is his just response his actions of justice against evil, right? So, so picture the, the worst, the most evil thing that, that you could imagine, maybe that you have ever experienced personally or, or maybe something you have heard of, and ask, what would it say about God if God simply ignored it? If God simply said, no big deal, for all of eternity, I'm not even going to raise the issue. How is God just? How is God just? And we think of some of the great evils that have been perpetuated in history. And what God's wrath means is that there will be accountability. Now, this is the first time, potentially that you should get a gut punch. It is revealed against all, all ungodliness and unrighteousness. God's justice demands that he deal with every form of unrighteousness. Every word that we speak behind someone's back demands God's justice. Every kindness that we ignore and walk away from because we can't be bothered, demands God's justice. If God does not address those issues, he is not just. Also note that we tend to see that God, think of God's wrath as something that is coming in the future. Notice the present tense. God's wrath is is revealed right now from heaven. It doesn't mean that there isn't a final future judgment. That's exactly what next week's passage is going to talk about. It means that there is also a present aspect to God's justice and judgment, and that is what Paul is going to outline in the rest of today's passage. So verse 18 shows us that God's wrath is his righteous response to our unrighteousness. The reason... For the revelation of God's wrath is introduced at the very end of verse 18. Because by unrighteousness, by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. What we're going to see is that there is this disastrous exchange that takes place. We have exchanged the true God for a lie. We have replaced the creator with the creation. Think about this word suppress for a second. You can't suppress something unless it exists and unless you have some access to it. So Paul is, is even in that word making the point that truth is available but the response is to push it down. And the truth specifically that he highlights has to do with the nature and character of God. Verses 19 and 20 show us that God revealed himself in a way that is so understandable that people do not have any excuse for their unrighteousness. The way God revealed himself is through creation. And what creation shows us is 
is his divine nature and his eternal power. Think about that for a second. A book does not write itself, right? If you're, let's pick one. If you're reading The Hobbit, The Hobbit didn't come about because Bilbo Baggins sat down and wrote himself. The Hobbit came about because someone outside of that world, a guy by the name of Tolkien, sat down and created that world. Paul is saying the same thing is true with nature. You can look at creation and you can see that it did not create itself and you can draw conclusions. Whoever created this must be outside of, must, must be different from the creation that is created and he must have extraordinary power. The truth that unrighteousness suppresses is that there is a creator and that that creator is beyond creation. And they know it must be true, Paul is saying, but they live as if it isn't. And that is what leaves them without excuse. Verses 21 through 23 get to the very heart of what it is that makes sin, sin. And the heart of sin is, is idolatry. And here is the disastrous exchange so clearly proclaimed in verse 23. The glory of the immortal God was exchanged for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Idolatry exchanges the creator for creation. Instead of honoring God and giving thanks to God and glorifying God, they glorify images that resemble men and resemble elements of creation. And when we make that exchange, verse 21 says there are certain things that happen to us. We become futile in our thinking and our foolish hearts are darkened. What does that mean? It means that our reasoning and our emotions do not function the way they are supposed to function. It means that our wills, what desire, things that are not truly desirable. Okay, let's pause and talk about how idolatry works. What was Paul thinking of? Well, if you are worried about your livelihood, you need a good harvest. And you're in that culture, what do you do? You go find the nearest woodland creature, you drag it into the temple, and you sacrifice it. What if you want to have children? You go grab another woodland creature, do the same thing. What if you have a very important meeting coming up and you want positive results? you take out another wooden creature. Here's the point. Idolatry looks at something in nature. It could be a statue that was built and is in a temple. It could be the sun. It could be the moon. It could be anything in creation. And it says, that is what I am trusting in to protect me, to meet my needs, to give me value. It's that thing in creation. That is the essence of idolatry, and it is the heart of sin. It is looking to something in creation to do what only God should do and only God can do. We have legitimate needs, legitimate desires to be loved. Idolatry happens when we think that the only way that meeting that need or desire is going to happen depends completely on someone in creation. And whoever that is will become our idol. We will center our entire lives around pleasing that person and impressing that person. We have legitimate desire for safety. And we enter idolatry if we believe that our safety depends completely on certain income or, or a certain job. 
And if we do that, we will center our life around achieving and protecting that income or that job. In either case, we see how our thinking and our emotions and our desires start to get tainted and messed up. Let me contrast that with what it looks like to put God at the center, at the focus. If you honor and thank and glorify the creator, you approach the legitimate needs of life differently. You recognize that God works through those people to make his love tangible. Their love and acceptance are important. And if they abandon you, it is going to hurt, but it is not going to destroy you. And that is because you realize that the creator himself has not stopped loving you. He is greater than the creation. He is perfectly capable of loving you despite the rejection that you experience from a person. He is capable of expressing that love in tangible ways, in other ways through creation. And the same is true of our safety. If you lose a job or lose an income, we recognize that our security and safety depends on the creator, not something within the creation. And it works this way in every area of life. How do you think of right and wrong? Are they defined solely by the creation, by us, or are they defined by the creator? What do we think gives us value? How do we think we measure success? Is it ultimately by the standards that are within creation, or is it by our creator? How do you think of yourself? Your opinions, your rights, your desires, are they more important than the creator? The most common piece of creation that we use to replace the creator is ourselves. So here's how verses 19 through 23 fit together. Look at this extraordinary creation. There must be someone incredibly powerful to create it. There must be someone even greater than this creation. Someone outside of this creation. Wow. I think I'm going to center my life around this little piece of creation here. That's what Paul's arguing against. Verses 24 through 32 shows us the result of this dangerous exchange and how it gets unleashed in our life. Here again in verses 24 through 25 is, is this disastrous exchange that's at the heart of sin. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worship and served the creature. It is changing, putting the creation in the place of the creator. And what Paul is saying in these verses is that when we do that, God just allows it to play itself out. When it says God gave them up, he is using legal terminology, judicial terminology. It's a judge passing a, uh, passing a sentence. It's God basically saying, I'm going to judge idolatry by allowing to run its course. Here is the picture of sin in our lives that Paul creates in Romans 1. At the core is idolatry. At the core, it is us looking to meet something in our lives, even a very legitimate need, by something in creation. When we do that, it makes our desires and our emotions and our thinking distorted. And when that happens, it ultimately results in the visible things that we see in our lives and in the lives of others. This is important. Because very often we get this exactly wrong. Very often we start out here and we tell ourselves or we tell others, stop doing that. And then we get frustrated that we don't stop doing that. It's because we've never worked backwards to say, what's the idolatry that is at work in my life that is moving me in this direction? We need to reflect. We need to take time. And, and I hate to say this, but think about our sin. What was the goal that you had in saying those harsh words to that person? 
what did you hope it was going to accomplish if you reached that goal? You answer those two questions and you are starting to dig up idols. Answer them honestly. Your goal was more than just to confront them with their sin. Verses 26 through 31 lists 22 of these verbal evidences. And the issue, yeah, 26 through 31, and the issue that comes up in 26 through 37, 26 and 27 is the issue of homosexual behavior. And before we say anything else about these verses, there are two things that we have to clarify. And the first one is, what kind of relationship is Paul talking about here? The reason I say that is because if you read a lot of literature of his day, what is talked about is a type of homosexual relationship that was predatory. It was the powerful against the powerless. And that the, the predominance of that in the literature has caused some people to come to Romans 1 and say, the type of, of relationships that we have in our culture today that are, that are consensual, that, that are loving relationships, Paul didn't even know anything about that. That, just, that concept didn't even exist in his culture. In other words, what the, what the argument is, is Paul is talking about something that exists only in his culture, and there's no equivalent for today, because he wouldn't have even known about the sorts of relationships that we have today. I'm going to argue that that is, in fact, not the case. I think Paul certainly had in mind predatory relationships, and he certainly would include those in what he is speaking against. But it is not accurate to say that that's all he had in mind. It's not accurate to say that the culture of Paul's day did not know anything about the kind of relationships we have today. You can find references to loving homosexual relationships in Egyptian literature, Greek literature, Roman literature, and Jewish literature starting centuries before Romans 1. And in fact, during Paul's lifetime, there is literature that talks about consensual marriage between uh, same-sex couples. Our cultural experience of this issue was known to Paul, and it is part of what he is addressing. Boy, it would be a lot easier if he wasn't, but he was. Second, I want you to notice that he is talking about actions. Jews from, Jewish rabbis from the time, from before Jesus when they would go to passages that addressed homosexuality in the Old Testament, mainly Leviticus 18, they would understand that what that passage was talking about was not just attraction, but the actual action, the behavior. You go to early Christian literature, the people who are discipled by the apostles, and you ask, what is their understanding of what Paul wrote? And they would say the issue is the action, not the attraction. The question is, the issue is always, what do you do with the attraction? Do you act on it? What goes on in your thought life? It is the exact same set of issues faced by someone who is attracted to the opposite sex. What do you do with it? Paul is pointing to Genesis 1, and he is saying, God created nature. And within that nature, there are natural relationships between the sexes. And one of the ways that idolatry plays itself out is by the distortion of those natural relations. But here's why we can't rip these two verses out of their context. This is the first item on a list of 22 behaviors, attitudes, and traits that Paul is going to call sinful, although he doesn't use that terminology. 
He's going to at least say these are the outgrowth of idolatry. Everything on this list is a distortion. See, the point in this passage, remember the overall context, the point of the passage is that everyone is guilty. And he is creating the proof of that as he creates the list and creating a list that when you look at it, no one can say not guilty. Let's start with the list. You can really divide the list into three parts. The first part is four general vices. And they emphasize the depth of human depravity. And each of the four general vices describes an evil that people are willing to do to others in order to satisfy themselves. And so you get things like um, filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. Malice is just a way of saying being mean-spirited. Can we pause right there? Show of hands. Anyone here that's not been guilty of one of those four? Second set gives five vices. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit maliciousness. It's actually very similar to the first four, but now he's, he's being more specific. Each of these two is a, is a vice that describes an evil that humans will use to hurt one another. Okay, how are we doing? Anyone here never guilty of envy? Anyone here never lied? Never kind of spun the truth a little bit. Twelve terms in the third set. It's a whole list. Let's just look at verse verses 29 and 30 for a second. Anyone here who has who has never been insolent, that's an interesting word. It, it means condescending in what we say or do. Anyone here never gossiped? Never been haughty, which means proud. Never boasted. Oh, and just to make sure everyone's covered. (laughs) Anyone here never been disobedient to parents? These last four are really fascinating. Basically, what Paul is doing in these last four is he is showing how far we denigrate when we put the creation in the place of the creator. It's like we be, these terms are, are actually terms that you would use to describe the, the lowest, most vicious forms of animals in creation. Verse 32 just caps off Paul's argument. There is basic knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. Even if all you can see is the creation. There is a basic understanding that there are consequences for going against what is right. Yet idolaters not only do what is wrong, they often approve of those who do. You don't have to be the one that is mocking someone. You can be the one who's laughing at them or laughing with them as they do. There are lots of ways that we are guilty. Paul is saying, and I want to say this again and again because it's actually going to come out more clearly next week, but Paul is saying that Everyone struggles with putting the creation in the place of the creator, and that is idolatry. God's judgment on that idolatry is to allow it to play out. When you gossip, for example, you are not only acting out idolatry, you are actually executing God's judgment on yourself. And I realize, because it's quite possible I've done it a time or two in my life, That when I gossip, boy, it doesn't feel like I'm acting out God's judgment. 
until the people in my life don't trust me anymore. There's a famous quote. It says, the history of the world is the judgment of the world. One thing I don't like about that quote is it makes it out there. So let me change the quote. The history of Todd is the judgment of Todd. A lot of consequences I've suffered in my life because of the sin, the idolatry that I have engaged in. There's a question that hovers over this whole passage. How do we live in light of this disastrous exchange that we have made? I'm gonna wrap up by sharing some thoughts. Let's start with ourselves. How do we respond to the fact that we, in fact, constantly replace the creator with creation? What Paul would scream out as loudly as possible from this passage is, own your mess. Do you believe that gossip belongs on the same list as murder? Do you blow off, do you just blow off that your pride is on the same list as hater of God? Does it affect you at all? That your greed is right there with inventor of evil. If your sin doesn't move you at that level, which means all of us, then the application for us today is to fall on our knees before God and ask him to break our hearts. Ask him to show us what are the idols that we are serving. And I have to lead the way in this because I operate every single day as if my pride, my condescending attitudes don't really belong on the same list. But there they are. What do we do when someone we love is displaying something on this list? 22 things. Key word here is patience. Why do I say that? Well, depending on your role in that person's life, it, it's possible that it's your responsibility to make sure that they know that what they're doing is wrong. But frankly, they usually do. It is always our responsibility to point them to the love and grace of Jesus. Remember, the core issue in their sin is idolatry. The idolatry is an effort to meet the desire for love or safety or some other legitimate need. And if our only message is that you are wrong to do this, you are not going far enough. They need, we need a vision of where I find love and safety and my other longings that is a better option than my idol. You must constantly model and point to the character of Christ because that's where that vision comes from. You will not debate someone out of releasing an idol. They must have a more compelling vision. And then you trust the Holy Spirit to work. He will convict on his timing and in his way. He will solidify that vision in his timing and in his way. The big question that many of you are asking is how do I love someone who has come out as a member of the LGBTQ community? And sadly, we have to admit that for years, people in churches have pulled today's passage out of its context and used it as an excuse to be self-righteous. The very opposite of what Paul intended. So let me be clear. If we leave here today 
And what we are leaving here with is something different from an appreciation and conviction and grief over the depth of our sin, then we have missed the point. I also want to acknowledge that this issue is not a theoretical issue for me. Ann and I have an adult son, Daniel, who has come out as gay. And he knows that this is the sermon this morning. He gave me permission to share this. Ann and I have spent hours listening to his story, his struggles and fears, his confusion about how does he put together the fact that same-sex attraction is all he has known his entire life with what the Bible says in Romans 1. I want to share three lessons that I would say Ann and I have learned. I think it would be more accurate to say that Ann and I are learning. Lesson number one, lead with love. If a member of the LGBTQ community walks into a church, studies have been done on this. Do you know what the most common reaction that they get? Someone will feel that it is their responsibility, whether they know that person or not, to take them to Romans 1 and Leviticus 18 and say, you know this is sin. And that person feels like they have just been defined by their struggle, which they may or may not even see as a struggle. They have been defined by one part of who they are. Their entire person is defined by a single thing. Lead with love. Not because we are ignoring Romans 1, but because Romans 1 is true. Every person who walks into this church or any church is a sinner dependent completely on the grace of God. You must, you must show others the exact same love and grace that you received from God. Second lesson, Jesus seems a lot more concerned, or a lot less concerned, excuse me, say that right. Jesus, this is why I write this out. Jesus seems a lot less concerned about implying what we improve than we are. Jesus seems a lot less concerned about implying our approval than we are concerned. Why do I say that? Jesus entered the home of a tax collector and shared a meal with him. Do you understand what that meant in his day? I promise you that there's not anything that you can do that would imply approval of sin more than Jesus entering the home of a tax collector and sharing a meal. I promise you. Implying approval of sin was not the issue for Jesus. Jesus was always clear on what was sin, what was righteous, and what was unrighteous. And he never, ever stopped entering into the lives of the unrighteous. Here's how that plays out in our house. Our son and his partner are always welcome in our home. We have parameters, but he is always welcome in our home. Third, trust the Holy Spirit. I will never say to Daniel that I think homosexuality is not a sin because I, the Bible says that. And he knows what I think. So now what I need to do is trust the Holy Spirit to convict 
when and how he will. Honestly, every single one of us will spend our entire lives dealing with things listed in Romans 1. The Holy Spirit will convict us of some of them very quickly. And there are others that he is going to wait on for reasons we do not understand. Some issues are going to be a lifetime process and they will only be resolved once we get to heaven. I can trust the Holy Spirit to work when and how he will work in the lives of the people I love, including Daniel and including you. And I hope you do the same for me. In the early 1900s, there was a noteworthy British publication that ran a series of articles called What is Wrong with the World? And they invited many of the greatest writers and thinkers of that time to contribute articles to answer that question. And one of the people that they invited was a fantastic Christian writer named G.K. Chesterton. His article was four words long. What is wrong with the world? Here was his article. Dear sirs, I am. G.K. Chesterton. That is exactly what Paul wants us to walk away from with this message. What is wrong with the world? You are. I am. God's wrath is being revealed right now in our lives. Why? Because we are all idol worshipers. Don't believe me? Look at how many of the things on the list of Romans 1 are in your life. And that is Paul's point as he prepares to take us to the grace of God. Paul's point in this passage is that your idolatry deserves God's wrath. That is the point of the passage, but I cannot leave us there. Paul is going to go on in Romans to explain that in Christ we have perfect righteousness and are completely delivered from God's wrath. Jesus took all of the wrath that was meant because of our idolatry to come to us. He took it on himself when he died on the cross. And you get full credit for all of his righteousness. All you have to do is believe in him. So let's go back to a question that we asked towards the beginning. Can I look at a sinner and love them, delight in them, want to be around them as much as possible, want to just be together? The answer to that question is yes, because that is exactly how God looks at you. How do we respond? I would encourage you to rewrite this passage in your own words. There are a lot of words I didn't define, didn't dig into. Take time. Look them up. Here's a reality. There is not a person in this room who is not guilty at some level of self-righteousness. There's not a person in this room that doesn't look at some of the sins on that list and say, wow, look at them how bad they are, because they're not the sins that we struggle with on that list. The bad news is someone's looking at us and doing the same thing. What does it mean to take a step towards someone that you have treated, whether they know it or not, with an attitude of self-righteousness? It might be a matter of prayer. It might be a matter of sending an encouraging email or card or just just remembering that this person stands right next to you as someone in need of the grace of God. I think the core application of this passage is to repent of our idolatry. 
And to get there, we need to take time every day and reflect on what our idolatry is. What have we done today that, that belongs on this list of Romans 1? And asking the real questions, what was my goal when I was trying to do that? And, and if I got that goal, what was I hoping was going to happen to me, for me? And then we're starting to dig up that idol. Reflect on that. And then that becomes the basis of repentance. We are going to do something that I don't know that we've ever done before. We're going to ask you to stand up and tell us your sin. Um, um, no, we're not going to ask you to stand. Um, we are going to ask you to go before the Lord silently in a time of confession. Uh, I'm actually going to ask the prayer team to come forward. We're going to be up here and if you want to pray with someone, they're going to be here to pray with you in a time of confession. If you're sitting next to someone and you want to pray with them, that's fine too. Just a time of confession. And if you're not comfortable praying, you're not, it's not what you normally do, that's okay. Just spend time thinking about the God of creation loves you despite whatever it is that you know is wrong in your life. He loves you. Let's take a few seconds of silence and spend time in confession, and then I'll close this in prayer. Prayer team, if you'd come forward, there may be people who want to pray with someone um, during this time.